We're going to start again now for our uh, final session of the day, uh, which is entitled What Cities Should Do. And we have three uh, distinguished speakers for this session. We have first Lloyd Grossman, who is chairman of the Heritage Alliance. And he's going to talk, obviously, about the way in which heritage and the protection and care of the built environment contributes to, well, I'm not, you may not be, but I'm just guessing, uh, what, it, what the way that contributes to what cities do. Uh, Sir Howard Bernstein, the chief executive of uh, Manchester City Council and a legend in knowing what cities should do. And uh, James Beresford, who is chief executive of Visit England and who off, doubtless has a, an equal all round England view about what cities should do because he has to promote them all. But perhaps we could bring, begin with you, Lloyd. Okay, absolutely. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for inviting me here today. So the simple question, deceptively simple question, is um, what cities should do and I decided, for the sake of brevity, that I could distill my message into two words. That's it. You can rest for the next 10 minutes, and I'll come back to them afterwards. Um, so be different ought to be the strategy that any city adopts. And then the other elements of things like enhancing and celebrating and promoting that difference are all tactics. So the question is, why be different? Why is being different a good thing? Well, it all, of course, like everything else, has to do with globalization. Um, globalization is uh, very easy to demonize. But of course, it has brought a lot of benefits to all of us. Um, portability, uh, flexibility, economies of scale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, Technology and media and economics have all come together to create what uh, I call the homogenized world. Here are a few examples of the homogenized world. Oh, see those everywhere? Not sure where that Gucci is, but it looks like every other Gucci I've seen. And of course, the most ubiquitous restaurant in the world, McDonald's. And in this homogenized world, people are absolutely crying out for distinctiveness. The reason is that conformity and homogenization is a real bore, isn't it? I mean, what's the point? Um, it's difference that's interesting. And difference has value, difference has excitement. And the struggle to be different, the need to be different, isn't just something that's confined to the world of celebrity. Um, it's all about our physical world too. It's about our built environment, it's about our cities and our towns and our villages. Um, it's all about the buildings and the townscapes and the landscapes that surround us and add some context to our lives. Now this is um, Dubai. And this is uh, Shanghai, or possibly that's Shanghai, and maybe that's Dubai. I'm not really sure, but you see, there's a certain sameness, isn't there? A certain sense of cities that don't really have much going for them. Um, and to me, like so many other modern developments, those sort of cities don't have anything distinctive going for them. Um, those of us who can remember the uh, so-called era of the beatniks may also remember a wonderful beatnik expression, which was uh, when someone who is incredibly boring was described as being from nowheresville. <laughs> and increasingly, as I travel around the world, I, I often find I'm going from one nowheresville to another. And that means that the places that actually have some beauty and some interest and some distinctiveness are the places that stand out and the places we want to go to. Now, the basic infrastructure of most successful cities is pretty much the same. You know, they all have decent public transport and they all have you know, perfectly workable telecoms and efficient airports. Um, 
And do you know that depressing feeling when you're driving from city A out to city airport B and all the roads seem to look like every other airport road you've seen anywhere in the world? There's slightly too much of that going on. So I would say that the question today in terms of making cities attractive is not about those things that are comparable, but they're about the incomparables, about the things that are different and distinctive. So the question is, how do you find out what's incomparable about your city? And you've got to take a very hard look at it and ask, what is it that makes it different? What does your city have that other cities don't? Now, in European cities in particular, the competitive advantage almost invariably comes from heritage, from the historic, physical, and cultural context. Those are the things that can't be copied. Now, I've just returned from a wonderful weekend in Ghent, in Belgium. Ghent has very pretty canals. Here is one. But, you know, if you think about canals, well, you know, Bruges has really nice canals. Uh, Antwerp has great canals. Venice has lots and lots of canals. Birmingham has terrific canals. So, canals are a pretty oversupplied market. So, what is it that can make Ghent different? Well, Ghent has one of the supreme masterpieces of European art, which is the great altarpiece of the adoration of the mystic lamb in Ghent Cathedral by the Van Eyck brothers. And because that's now undergoing a very lengthy and complicated restoration project, the city of Ghent have used that as a peg upon which to hang themselves as a destination. And Ghent is very much being marketed now as the city of Van Eyck. So there are a number of Van Eyck exhibitions, there are tourist trails, etc., etc., etc. Now, of course, Ghent does have a lot of other attractions, but it's Van Eyck, it's the altarpiece that is the unique, distinctive, and uncopyable claim that Ghent has to being globally recognized. And that's an incredibly important lesson, and the lesson is that real competitive advantage comes from that which cannot be reproduced anywhere else. And it's hardly a new idea. You know, if we look at the ancient world, there are, for example, things like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Great Library of Alexandria, things that couldn't be found in any other city. And that's what city ne cities need in order to stake a claim in the global market. Of course, trying to reproduce what is unreproducible has not stopped some people from trying. Uh, this, for example, is the Las Vegas version of Paris. Doesn't quite arouse the same emotional response, does it? Now, the heritage being so important in terms of distinctiveness has to be understood as being very pervasive. So the heritage is not just about the obvious, what I would call heritage honeypots. Because wherever you look, most major visitor attractions, most major cultural institutions, most major universities are housed in heritage buildings. It's also worth remembering the importance of the so-called intangible heritage. And the intangible heritage, which people often disregard, has a huge role to play in terms of placemaking and distinctiveness. So what is intangible heritage? Intangible heritage is the way we do stuff. For example, the dance they do in Barcelona in front of the cathedral is a wonderful example of distinctive, uncopyable, intangible heritage. The way they drink beer in Munich is another example of intangible heritage as is the way they cook in Naples. Now, in the globalized world, we have a very crowded marketplace with endless destinations competing against each other, and getting heard above the din becomes increasingly difficult. So there is, unsurprisingly, very fierce competition to host the international events, 
And there's the increasing importance of all sorts of accolades, such as City of Culture and initiatives like the World Cities Cultural Forum. Now, many of you will be from cities in which the built heritage is the principal asset. But it's an asset that needs investment. It's a constant worry because there is almost by definition there's more heritage to look after every year than there was the year before. And heritage becomes more and more expensive to support the older it gets. And this burden is particularly acute in heritage-rich countries that are undergoing economic problems, like Italy, for example, which has an extraordinarily high proportion of the, of the world's cultural heritage. But the most significant thing to recognize about heritage is that it can't be resurrected. You can repurpose it, you can reinterpret it, but once heritage is gone, it's gone forever. So heritage is one of those assets that needs constant investment in order to play its role in terms of generating economic activity and community spirit and purpose. The Council of Europe published a very interesting piece about the value of heritage recently in which they pointed out that it's a non-renewable resource, but it's a strategic resource for a sustainable Europe. One important point to make is that heritage is not just for tourists. I can show this because I'm American. Um, heritage is not just for tourists. If you want to create a destination that's worth visiting, that's not an exercise that you can isolate from making sure that the destination first and foremost has to be a great place in which to live and a great place in which to work. So you have to have a wonderful city for its citizens first before you can even pretend to have a wonderful destination. So the final message I would give you is know your city, love your city, and don't be ashamed of standing up and saying we're different and we're proud of it. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Lloyd. You remind me in saying that of um, the, um, on the uh, presentation we saw from Hans Dominicus this morning, he, he had Bruce Katz, who when he was in Britain a few months ago promoting a book, uh, was fond of quoting Dolly Parton, uh, saying, find out who you are and then do it on purpose, <laughs> uh, which is a, sort of the same ballpark. Anyway, now I'm going to go back to the way we dealt with this the first time, the first session, uh, which is to ask if anybody would like to ask questions to Lloyd on what he's just said, and then we'll do the same with Howard, um, and then same with James. So questions to Lloyd. Yeah. Shout. Eclectic bars. Well, can I? I'll give you an example. Ah, so, <laughs> right, go on. Give it's the only example. place that I know where you go into a bar and they have very expensive glasses and you have to leave a shoe as a deposit. <laughs> and next door they have another bar where a crazy guy sits in a rocking chair in his pajamas and you sit on church pews and you listen to organ music and drink beers no one's ever heard of, for example. So oh. I'm just curious because Banek is great. But it's amazing. <laughs> but I'm just wondering because I'm also interested the way that we act in different cities, do we not in the modern world want to do the same thing in other cities? So when I'm in London, I love to hear about quirky, cool new places. When I go to somewhere like Ghent, if someone tells me that's one of the attractions, that might be one of the first things I want to do. Right, okay. Yeah, I think I went to that bar where you have to leave your shoe, and I thought it was pretty good. And um, eclectic and interesting bars are a major tourist attraction of, 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 of any city. However, I would say that it, it's very difficult in terms of marketing yourself to say, hey, we're the world capital of eclectic bars, because a lot of other cities would be able to make a similar claim. Whereas you can fasten on to something like Van Eyck, and no one can deny 
that Ghent is the city of Van Eyck, that, that, you know, that that's, that's the distinctive, unreproducible, indisputable claim that Ghent can make. And then underneath that, you have varying other claims, such as we have great bars, we have great canals, and so on. But you know, you've got to fasten on something that is so distinctive that no one else can copy it. Is there not a difficulty, though, um, Lloyd, in that people do, obviously, and I think it's very hard to dispute the fact that people want the things that are different, but do they not also want things that are the same? Do they not also want homo homogeneity as well? I mean, the Gucci's and the Starbucks, they kind of expect those as well as wanting these unique differentiating features as well. Is that possible? Yeah, it is possible, but you can be sure, you know, sure as eggs are eggs, wherever you go in the world, there's going to be a Starbucks. So to promote a city based on the fact that, oh, we have Starbucks too, is not necessarily that exciting. You know, where people can get the standard stuff wherever they go, what they can't get is the untransportable, uncopyable stuff. Right, over here. Um, yeah, hi, uh, it's Tom Jenkins here. Um, I have a Lloyd-inspired question for the whole panel. Uh, Lloyd said that once heritage is gone, it is gone forever. But this statement itself is to be qualified if you look at Dresden, where they've rebuilt the Frankirch, if you look at Berlin, where they're building, rebuilding the Bauer Academy and most of Unter der Linden, um, if you look at Krakow, if you look at Warsaw, uh, you're seeing immense reconstructions of once lost heritage. Now, my question to the panel is, if they could think of one building that's been demolished in the last 60 years in the UK, which one would they rebuild? Are you going to give us any examples of one that have you, you put your top of your list for having been particularly in need of rebuilding? <laughs> all right, I would no, 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 It's all been broadcast, you know. I know. Right. I could give you a lot more example of buildings that have been built in the last 60 years that should be demolished. <laughs> <laughs> Howard, do you want to uh, chip in on this one? I mean, he did invite uh, the My old house, house, that would be uh, old <laughs> a, a good one. Um, I, I just think it's very easy for, for, for people to think about heritage as being about history. Um, I think heritage also can be a celebration of what places are today. And I, I think Lloyd, when he, he said in his contribution earlier about how you can re-energize and repurpose uh, heritage assets, I, I think that's one of the key challenges which different places have, have got and I think it's fair to say whether it's in this country or elsewhere some of us have risen to the challenge better than, than others uh, on that and I'm not talking exclusively about Manchester uh, I think there have been occasions where we've not quite uh, delivered the outcomes we should have done so I do think there are real opportunities to celebrate how places are today and at the same time uh, classify them as real heritage assets. James. Uh, no, Tom, I really can't think of a building that I wish hadn't been torn down. Um, I think I can look back with regret at some of the uh, rather more uh, unsympathetic planning of the 60s and early 70s, which have taken no regard for the heart and soul of our cities and our heritage of our cities. Um, and, you know, I can think of several towns, several of which are, and cities, several of which are probably represented here in the audience today. So I, I, it would be gauche of me to, to, to say which those are. But in essence, not only have they destroyed the approach of the place and the look of the place, but they've actually destroyed the connectivity of the heritage assets in some of those cities. Um, and I would cheerfully rip up those planning errors to reconnect in a more sympathetic way some of the heritage. I mean, anybody here from, Li anybody here from Liverpool, he said, given where we're sitting. I was going to say the, the elevated railway. I do wonder, I often wonder as somebody from outside Liverpool who remembers the elevated railway that ran along the docks 
it, uh, the equivalent in New York has been turned, after all, into the High Line. And I do just wonder whether that, that overhead electric railway had survived. Or just a little bit longer, it couldn't have been turned into something analogous to that. I mean, does that make sense? I mean, that's mm. something I would definitely personally add to any list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, OK, good. I've um, got my iPad at the moment, an artist's impression of what the revenue building or the customs house would have looked against the uh, current designs for Liverpool One. So uh, that's one building which got pulled down, which was magnificent <laughs> neoclassical building. And that's been pulled, that was pulled down? That was pulled down straight after the war. I, I think probably in terms of, 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 of cities and tourism, one of the biggest disasters um, in terms of demolition was when Paris decided to destroy the central marketplace, Les Halles, which um, you know, could have been another Covent Garden, it could have been another market district in Boston, etc., etc. So they tore down this magnificent 19th century market complex, replaced it with a subterranean shopping center, which immediately became a sink for crime, drugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now they're having to rethink how they reinvent this very central space in Paris because they tore down a huge heritage asset unthinkingly. Um, We're inching I'm, towards Euston sorry, Station here, aren't we? Yeah, I was, really, I was going to say I'm really pleased that Paris managed to muck something up at the expense of uh, their <laughs> tourism assets, Lloyd. I mean, Howard, it, Manchester, it seems to be the new Manchester, modern Manchester, it, I'm, I'm right in thinking, must have thought long and hard about preserving many of the industrial warehouses which are now used, I mean, like this one, mm. isn't quite yet used but will be. Um, as places for people to live and to work today. That must have been, I assume that was a conscious, it was. thought through, yeah. what to do with them type decision. Yeah. yeah. Um, regener regeneration is, is not just about new build. Regeneration is about, you know, re-energizing, repurposing assets. Um, you know, you get into controversy occasionally where notwithstanding all the creativity in the world, you can't quite find uh, a rationale for continuing to invest in certain uh, heritage assets and I, I'm very clear that as long as you've exhausted uh, every option and, and, and that process has been inclusive as well, then we have to face up to realities at times of, of moving on. Um, but you know, I think we also prove alongside other places um, that you can uh, define uh, long-term sustainable uses on the back of assets which at one time were regarded as redundant. Mm. Okay, we'll take one or two more two questions to Lloyd. Doesn't mean we can't ask more to him after Howard's spoken, but uh, further question to Lloyd about um, his... Yes. Uh, I'm with, uh, Alan Clark, Northern Ireland Tourist Board. I was going to speak about the real Titanic town, uh, which is Belfast. It's maybe quite an interesting aspect about re recreating heritage because I suppose Belfast went through a, 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 a bit where it basically turned its back on Titanic because it was always seen as a disaster. And why would you want to celebrate a disaster, and quite a sensitive disaster at that, <laughs> to whereby we have now developed you know, a 90 million pound attraction. But the really interesting aspect is that the new attraction actually is the most successful in terms of economic benefit because it gets the throughput of visitors. You know, first year was 800,000 visitors to, to that. But what we've really struggled with is the authentic elements of Titanic in terms of their viability. So the, the commercial element in terms of tourism has come from new development, celebrating a, a story. But to make us successful, we had to get public buy-in. And it went through a phase where Belfast had a joke about Titanic. She was okay when she left us. Um, <laughs> to whereby now people have a pride. Uh, and it's taken some years to do that, but the local media has been crucial to that. It's actually turning the media around to actually see the celebration of innovation and entrepreneurship that actually built the ship, to whereby people now see that pride as being local. But I think what we've really struggled with is we brought back the SS Nomadic, which was the original tendership uh, for Titanic. We've got the drawing offices being restored. We've got the slipways being restored. But their viability is really difficult. Uh, and customers are still, the throughput of customers is still going to the new heritage, new visitor attraction, telling the story. 
But where the struggle really has come with is actually getting the customers in sufficient numbers to make what you might say the original heritage assets uh, commercial and viable. I just wonder if Lloyd has any thoughts on that in terms of that recreation of heritage against what we would say would be the authentic elements of, her of heritage. Well, I think with uh, Titanic and Belfast, um, it's it's not so much recreation as a. Um, it, it was time to have a revisionist look at the whole history of the Titanic disaster. Um, it was necessary to build a new visitor center because, of course, there wasn't a heritage asset left behind that could be used. And in many ways, the authenticity of that project comes from the scholarship that was behind it and from the intention. You know, there was an honest intention. There wasn't an intention to create a disaster theme park. It was a genuine desire to reconnect the history of Titanic with the history of, of Belfast. And because it's been very beautifully and very honestly done, I think that gives it an authenticity which is very attractive. It wasn't, at least it seemed to me, not to be a cynical exercise but to be a genuine attempt to reinterpret a very important moment in the history of Belfast. But the point, your point was also that despite the fact that the new ex exhibition has worked, that the original uh, tender, which is an authentic piece of history, uh, which actually sailed to and from the mm. Titanic to load people onto it, has been less successful. Is that, is, is, is that the problem you've got? Can you have the microphone? We all saw the, the project at the start was to make the connection between Belfast and Titanic, you know, an international brand, but tell it in that real way. But we all saw core value has been authenticity. Uh, but yet, you could argue that the, the, the story is told in a modern visitor attraction. It's not a museum. It's, it's purposely a, a visitor attraction. And it does tell the story uh, in, in a very honest way. And we always have to balance what you might say the celebration of the, uh, the, entrepreneur, the entrepreneurship and the innovation with the commemoration of you know, the 1,500 people who lost their lives. You have to have that balance continually. But we all saw the, the essence of value would be in authenticity. But truthfully, authenticity has been the piece of the jigsaw that probably from a commercial viability sustainability has worked less yet we all saw it as a key ingredient of the project now i would probably argue that the project would be much less successful if you didn't have the authentic elements but i think it in terms of economic benefit and tourism they're less important uh, to the overall visitor experience than probably we would have thought at the start yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's quite an interesting point. I mean, certainly you need the real artifacts there to underpin the authenticity of the experience. But I, I would probably say that the Titanic um, exhibition is um, a, a one-of-a-kind thing. And it's also, it's very difficult to, you know, draw the line between what is a visitor attraction and what is a museum. Because in many ways, yeah, you, you think it's a visitor attraction, but it also combines many of the elements that a conventional museum would have. And you know, it reminds me of the great quote from Marshall McLuhan, who said that you know, anyone who thinks there's a difference between education and entertainment doesn't know anything about either of them. So you know, there, there is a blurred line, which I think uh, that successfully straddles. And I suppose that, too, I mean, the, I was talking about this earlier on, given that this building is called the Titanic Hotel, after all, um, you know, that the, the mythic status of the Titanic and the fact that it is probably known to many people, at least as well through film as in any other mm. way, would lead you to uh, an exhibition which is such a powerful metaphor, as well as being related to physical artefacts. But it's just a piece of cold art theory made up on the hoof here. I'll stop there. Right. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thank Lloyd. You. You can come back later. Now, uh, we're going uh, next to hear from Sir Howard Bernstein, who, as I said, is the chief executive of Manchester City Council. We talked about Manchester a bit this morning, and the mayor glowingly uh, talked about Manchester Airport and Liverpool's desire to work with Manchester on connectivity. We'll be happy to hear. Delighted to hear that. Um, um, well, actually, Lloyd's already done my speech uh, <laughs> on the basis of, uh, of his contribution. So what I just wanted to do, really, was, was just focus on three or four things which I think helped to uh, make the very clear uh, link between uh, tourism and growth 
because I think those are two uh, very important parts of, of the same coin. First of all, um, all of us, whether we're a town, whether we're a big city, even London, uh, all of us today have to find their way in this very big, complex global market. Uh, and I think um, any place which has a very clear analysis about its future needs to be rooted in how that global market could impact upon its own uh, strategies and plans. And, and I think one of the great things Manchester has done over the years is, is never be afraid to question our role, never be afraid to question our positioning and to understand what some of the externalities might be um, which actually will impact upon what we're trying to do. And if you look at the globalisation uh, process today, uh, you see different continents, uh, you see the Far East, you see Europe, North America, the South America, um, you see Europe continuing to decrease in importance uh, financially and economically. Uh, you see the Far East continuing to increase uh, in economic importance. North America more or less staying where it is, but the big challenge over the next 10 years is whether or not the Far East actually outstrips North America uh, to become the most powerful uh, continent in the world. Uh, what does all that mean for, for places like Manchester or indeed Liverpool? Well, I'll tell you what it means is that we are fortunate, it's certainly Manchester, to be one of the top 600 uh, cities in the world. But over the next 10 years, at least 200 of those 600 will change. Uh, and at least 100 new cities will be from the Far East. That, I think, tells us quite a lot about the dynamics and, and how we have to develop a whole range of strategies, which is about how we retain our positioning and, more importantly, how we actually remain economically successful over the next decade. So that's the globalisation pro. The second thing is, is what I think the role of, 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 of local government cities actually are. Um, the conventional approach, if you, depending on whom you talk to, is that good, even good local government is about how you deliver good quality uh, local services. That's partly right. But the really important analysis about what constitutes good local government, I think, is about how local government should exercise real leadership in shaping a place. How you make places uh, attractive for visitors, for investors, for people to choose to live. That's certainly what's characterised our approach in Manchester and Greater Manchester over the last decade or more and it's certainly one which I believe is very, very important because it's only local government which has the democratic mandate to be able to exercise that leadership role. Yes, of course, it needs to be exercised on an inclusive basis and responsibly working with a whole range of stakeholders, including business and including other uh, key participants in the economic and social health of a place. But fundamentally, our role is to shape places where people want to live, where they want to work and where they want to play. Where does tourism uh, fit in that? Well, I, I agree with uh, Lloyd, really. Um, you can't have an effective tourism plan unless you've got an effective growth plan or an effective plan for making your place somewhere where people want to visit, where people want to invest. And in my experience, I know that's not exclusive, uh, but in my experience, the sorts of things which create a powerful narrative about how you create a destination uh, city uh, are as much uh, are to do with all the things which influence a business to make a decision to expand their business or indeed to locate in a city. They all are part uh, together. So I, I'm passionate about understanding those uh, interdependencies. And tourism, of course, is, is hugely, hugely important. I think the growth and development of the tourist uh, industry and the cultural base in Manchester over the last decade or more has helped to diversify uh, and expand our economic uh, base. In the last five years, the value of tourism to Greater Manchester has grown by just less than 30%. We now generate something like 6.5 billion a year. We welcome 
uh, uh, loads of visitors a year who support over 84,000 jobs. And over the next five years, uh, we want to increase that jobs uh, total from 85 or 84,000 to 115,000. We actually want to uh, increase from 6.5 billion to 8.8 .8 billion the value of tourism to our economy and we want to generate significant additional job uh, opportunities. And that puts us uh, in third behind Edinburgh and London, uh, but more particularly as a result of driving particular strategies, uh, we have seen quite significant increases in the places where increasingly we want to trade with from an international trading perspective. So we've seen uh, in Brazil massive increases uh, in terms of visitors, uh, an increase of 345%. Russia, increase of 40%. India, increase of 86%. And crucially, uh, China. And indeed, if, if I talk, or when I talk to some of our leading store managers, uh, and I talk about uh, levels of growth in retail spend and sales within uh, Manchester, they, they say we're enjoying significant levels of increasing growth and most of that is attributable to all these international visitors coming in and buying all our luxury goods. Um, and of course, Manchester and football, now that's a sore point in, in Liverpool and has been uh, for a, a few weeks. But fundamentally, uh, with City and United, uh, you know, the economic impact uh, which we generate now from you know, European football, football generally, is, is something of the order of £330 million in GVA, and that has been over 2010-2011. Uh, so therefore, every four years, or four or five years, we have the opportunity, assuming continued success, uh, of generating the economic equivalent of an Olympic Games every four years in Manchester. And therefore, that is an important part of our, of our wealth creation strategy. Of course, it wasn't always like that. We have done a lot in Manchester, Greater Manchester. We've, we've seen significant levels of public investment uh, in retail, uh, the network of theatres, museums and galleries, which I believe are really of world-class stature in, in no, dis no different way than the same uh, situation is enjoyed here in Liverpool. We've got conference exhibition facilities. I think we have one of the most sophisticated approaches to events, <coughs> particularly our Manchester International Festival, which is uh, every uh, two years and focuses exclusively on new commissions. Uh, we also look at how we drive a whole range of improvements in our visitor infrastructure. So for us, a growth plan has to have tourism at its very, very heart because you can't be a strong destination city without being a strong, uh, comprehensive, business-friendly uh, city as well. So understanding visitors, knowing our strengths, communications, having a competitive but distinctive product which very much focuses on the themes which Lloyd communicating are, I think, absolutely uh, key. One final point, delivery. Um, um, one of the things we have to do increasingly, I believe, where, where tourism is concerned, is actually address not just strategies so that they are a fundamental part of growth. Uh, I don't think everywhere you see that, but fundamentally how you deliver through partnership uh, clear uh, focus plans on, on the ground. We're very fortunate we have Marketing Manchester, Drew Stokes, Chief Executive, of Marketing Manchester is at the back of the room and they are responsible for executing integrated approaches to destination and marketing plans, not just for Manchester, but for Greater Manchester and whole. And increasingly what we've done is align Drew and Marketing Manchester's activities with our wider growth infrastructure as well. So how we drive economic intelligence uh, activities, how we drive business trade support, inward investment activities is now being addressed in an integrated way. That's not just a function of the fiscal realities we all have to work within. It is absolutely a direct response of promoting that integrated, comprehensive approach to growth uh, uh, going forward. And discrete partnership arrangement, whether through Marketing Manchester 
uh, are no substitute also for what I would describe as a network of collaborative platforms based around particular stakeholders within your own place and also nationally as well. hope that's been useful. Thanks very much. Now, um, Howard has to leave at 20 past four, so we can take some questions specifically to him, but it won't, again, let's do this in a convivial way. We can broaden the questions out a bit as well, but the question at the front here first. So concentrate them to Howard if possible. Uh, good afternoon, Stephen Roberts. I'm a local hotelier, and this question is obviously to Sir Howard. Sir Howard, I'd just like to ask whether or not you'd be prepared to share with the audience any eureka moments that you might have enjoyed while sitting in your bath about how the northwest and cities of the north can counter the economic threat that is London rather than us fighting amongst ourselves? Well, that would be a long bath. Uh, uh, um, I think that I, I'm one of these guys, actually, that doesn't see London as a threat. Um, I think, you know, we, there was a, I did a big business uh, event yesterday um, somewhere else uh, here. Um, and, you know, if you actually look at the economic dominance of London, you, that's not just in the context of Manchester, Liverpool, the North West, the North of England. If you looked at London's economic performance in the context of the rest of Europe, <laughs> you would see a pretty dominant uh, world city. Um, and I'm not one who thinks that by s somehow preventing London's growth it automatically uh, benefits everywhere else in the UK. So I'm not part uh, of, of that school. I think what we have to do outside uh, London is, is two things. One, uh, I think we have to think more creatively about how we join up uh, our, our strategies as cities. That's part of what we're trying to do through the Core Cities Network, which, which uh, Manchester, as well as Liverpool, are, are deeply uh, in, involved in. Um, uh, and I think the concept of interconnected cities from Liverpool all the way through to the other side of, you know, Hull and places like that is a very, very powerful economic corridor, a very, very powerful uh, economic driver. And I think we've, therefore, by doing that, you start to give more meaning to the government's very welcome strategic approach about rebalancing the economy, but until recently we hear very little about how that's going to be uh, delivered. And, and, and I think if we can start to address those types of activities um, and strategies, then I think we start to secure the opportunity for realising our full economic potential going forward. And the byproduct of that will be that when our young graduates, when our young talented people in Liverpool and still in Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, you know, choose to make career choices, uh, they choose our places rather than going down to London. And I think that applies particularly in the cultural technology and heritage fields as it does to many other sectors. James, I know these are questions to Howard, but James has a kind of England-wide responsibility, sure. so I think it's sure. a good person to get to. Well, well Tony, I, I will refer to this very briefly in my presentation. And mm. In fact, we had a conference on this issue, Mind the Gap, um, last week. Um, and like Sir Howard, you know, I am not saying London bad, rest of England good. That is not the case. You know, London is a world city for which I and this country uh, I have immense pride for. It is our leading attack brand in this country. Um, having said that, particularly in international tourism terms, the rest of the English cities, despite the, the, the advances made in Manchester and Liverpool and other cities, is lagging behind the undoubted growth that London is enjoying. And that, to my mind, can't be right. Um, but I don't look at it through a slightly depressed uh, set of, uh, of glasses. I look at it through a much more positive approach. And that is, what is the potential of our regional cities? What is the potential um, to grow outside London? And, you know, I think when we look at what cities can and must do, it has to be, what can we do to sweat more of the excellent asset that we have outside London, particularly in, in near, near Europe, because we've got very good air links with near Europe and with the mature markets in the States. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's an issue in this country, like no other country. I mean, I can just say, 
uh, from the chair, as it were, something just, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, in the 19th century, all these cities grew at the same time. So it's not impossible for them all to grow at once. And to take something Howard said, but I mean, my personal view, and I've chaired a commission, and Howard and I have been involved wearing other hats in the past on this issue. I mean, if you take an area like the Greater Manchester City Region or the Leeds City Region, <laughs> that the taxes paid in those areas will be broadly equivalent to what the government spends in those areas. And I think that in a, because England is so centralised, the real opportunity would be derived from allowing city regions to hold more of the money they generate to spend for themselves in the way they want, not relying on desks, however well-intentioned in London, to make them. I mean, that would be... Uh, you know, if I can add from the chair, I know I'm not supposed to be speaking today. But <laughs> is, that, is that fair? It's absolutely right. Uh, you know, we are passionate advocates of devolution, uh, but not everyone's in the same place. But until we can exercise more influence, if not control, over the way in which public spend is prioritised in Merseyside, Greater Manchester, as well as uh, places in Yorkshire in particular, we are not going to be in a position to exercise the leadership we can to drive our places going forward. Great. More questions? Yeah. Uh, microphone. Thank you. Uh, Gary Beckwith, City Cruises, and uh, also on the steering group of ETAWA. And for the panel, um, what advice can you give ETAWA so that we can um, you clearly all get tourism. There's a few councillors out there that don't get tourism. You know, what advice can you give us that we should be saying to councillors that don't get tourism? Uh, do your um, councillors get... Sorry, you're going. Well, you not every sorry. council seems to get tourism. No. Uh, I don't want to go uh, into specifics. No, no, but, no. no, no. But, um, and, and also, um, you know, with London as well, we've got 32... Uh, London boroughs there as well, so not all of those get it. And and obviously, um, Boris Johnson recently just bought three water cannons, so I'm not quite sure what message that gives to tourism as well. And and obviously now I, I believe he's been known as a bojo cop as well from buying those. So, so what advice would you give? Well, I won't ask the chief executive of Manchester to comment on the mayor of London's <laughs> purchase of <laughs> crime and disorder style. At, um, the sort of machinery and weapon, uh, whatever you call them, whatever you call it, I don't know, anyway. Howard, what about your councillors? Uh, well, I, I think we've all got an, a responsibility to articulate clearly the, the benefits of, of tourism. I, you know, I, it's one of the things that I was trying to communicate in, in what I was saying. It's not too long ago that tourism plans were somehow seen to be disconnected from the mainstream growth planning of, of individual places and, and I think the really progressive uh, places actually incorporate tourism plans as part of that. Uh, it's almost the equivalent nowadays of saying well we don't really, we're not really into public sector reform. Um, you know, you, you know we, the argument is you've got to have growth as well as reform and in my view uh, particularly the big cities, they've also got to have a tourism as a fundamental part of their growth plans. I, 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 Howard, uh, sorry, Lloyd, yes, I, I guess that uh, councillors probably find heritage a bit easier to understand, do they, than tourism, if you see what is one a portal to the other in some way? Well, I, th I think they are very intimately connected, but really, you know, to go back to the question about local authorities and whether they get tourism or not, I think it might be more useful to look at central government mm -hmm. and say they don't get tourism at all. You know, there has never been a realization that tourism is a real business. It is, whatever it is, the fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth largest industry in the country, yet it's not taken as seriously as other forms of economic enterprise. We have a, a, a tourism minister who's situated within what is one of the smallest and sadly least influential departments in the government. You know, where are the links between tourism and big business, between tourism and economic enterprise, between tourism and education? They don't seem to be there. Why doesn't the government take tourism more seriously and give it the attention and the respect and the consideration that such a large industry deserves? James, you must... Uh, oh, well, sorry, no. Stop round some I was going to say welcome to my world. Um, <laughs> it's a difficult one, it really is. And if you could bottle 
what that which Sir Howard has said and demonstrated in Manchester and what civic leaders have done here in Liverpool and convey that to other areas uh, and other local authorities, then it would be job done. But the cold hard facts of life are that not everybody has that ambition and the cold hard facts of life are that there have been some savage cuts to local authority funding and tourism is often the first to go. It, it is. It's a non-statutory service and it's often the first to go. Um, and uh, I, I, I probably better not comment on that which Lloyd has said, but um, I do think that um, we need to use a different language. We have found that you can't really use the word tourism in many circles because people just don't understand it. They don't take it as a serious job. They don't see that it's about inward investment, about quality of life, about services for local people. They don't see it. Um, and in this kind of current uh, world of financial constraint, it has to be about jobs, 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 jobs and jobs. And, you know, I often get thrown back at me, well, they're not serious jobs, they're part-time jobs, they're low-paid jobs, etc., etc. Well, actually, they're jobs, and they're entry-level jobs, and they're good jobs for young people, and also they are um, for those with entrepreneurial skills. Um, but we have to use a different language. It's how can tourism, culture, heritage, the arts, more generally contribute to the economic well-being of an area. That's the kind of language we have to use. Um, and increasingly, if we're supporting people's bids or advising people, we say don't use the word tourism, unfortunately. What word would you what, uh, instead using? I would use that which we've talked about today. It's how tourism can deliver on quality of life, economic impact, um, inward investment, and so on and so forth. It's not tourism for tourism's sake, I'm afraid. Okay. Come, we'll cut that. You'll still come back to that. Now, more questions because uh, Howard's got to go quite soon. So, yep, one here. Um, this is really for all three, I think. Uh, oh. First of all, there's, um, uh, there's Lloyd's very inspirational Be Different. Uh, secondly, there's Manchester's as a prime example of having an extremely well-organized destination organization which markets Manchester well in tourism terms. And thirdly, there's the fact that we've got fragmented small destination groups throughout England. Uh, and tourists don't really observe boundaries, particularly if they're touring. They, they want to go from one place to another. I mean, clearly there's the Peak District on the doorstep. There's Cumbria on the doorstep. Um, to what extent can you match marketing your own product with helping the hinterland to be with you to get more gain for the area as a whole? Okay, can I target that specifically at Howard, yes. just because it's obviously a Greater Manchester type question. We, we do that quite a lot, um, uh, perhaps we're not with the necessary uh, national uh, support that w we would like, but um, I can remember on the demise of uh, regional development agencies, an enormous amount of work was undertaken with colleagues here in Liverpool, uh, Merseyside, in order to support how different uh, sub-regions, Cheshire, uh, Cumbria, uh, to name, uh, and Lancashire. Um, and, you know, we never, you know, we're doing some good stuff, but not as much as we could with the right level of, of institutional and other support. One final question. I mean, you're, you're right for one more, are you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what further question for Howard? Yeah, right at the back there. Hi, uh, Tim Fairhurst from Atoa. Uh, just thinking what Sir Howard said about um, uh, wanting to align the appeal of the city both to business investors and visitors alike, um, I wonder whether, you know, as Manchester is a very big student city and one of your big exports is education, uh, attracting students from all over the world, and, and ultimately that is hopefully a catalyst for family and friends to come and visit their colleagues and children when they're students in Britain and so forth. I wonder if you've had any impact uh, or seen any impact on uh, visa regulation as affects foreign students in Britain and, and whether you welcome recent changes to uh, arrangements for Chinese visitors. Uh, I think it's too early to, to, to talk about the impacts on, on the changes to Chinese visitors and that's, that's certainly my, my, my line. I think um, the people who have tended to access uh, our universities uh, from international 
territories have been peopled by and large who can afford to access uh, those facilities. Um, and um, inevitably, it's helped to drive uh, a much more stable and balanced funding uh, uh, arrangement for the individual universities themselves uh, who may have been struggling to respond to, to, to some of the national uh, uh, funding uh, requirements. Uh, there's no evidence, frankly, that the impact on, on, on visas was impacting upon uh, student numbers. Uh, the, where we thought the real impact was, frankly, was in relation to uh, inward investment and, uh, and activities in that sort of area as well. And, uh, and I think perhaps some of the experiences which Manchester had uh, in the lead up to the appointment of the Chinese uh, investor on our airport city project may have had some influence uh, over the way in which some of those uh, regulations needed to be needed to be relaxed. But you know, you can't. You know, one final point: you can't uh, actually have as one of your key objectives, and it's undoubtedly right, the attraction of international investment. To, to, to England and the UK, and that then at the same time a whole, a whole range of restrictions which actually prohibits uh, investment uh, into the UK. Uh, and I hope that's uh, what, what you're looking for as a response. Okay. Well, Howard, thank you very much. You. I know you've got to go. We need to move on. So a round of applause for Howard as he leaves. <laughs> so miss... See you, uh, and then uh, we're now going to hear, we already have, a little more from James Berryford, who is the Chief Executive of Visit England, and therefore has, as I said earlier, a responsibility for all the cities and, indeed, urban and rural areas of England. Uh, thank you, uh, Tony, very much. The graveyard slot for me now, uh, particularly as uh, Lloyd and Sir Howard have said everything that you need to do. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions? No. Um, a, a brief for me. The the question is, what should cities do? Well, let me hone that down a little bit into what should cities do to grow tourism, because that's really the essence of that which we're talking about today. And um, looking around the room, I know that most of you will know the uh, economic power of tourism, and I am preaching to the converted. Um, clearly, tourism is worth £83 billion per annum to the economy. It is made up of day visits, a very important facet of the visitor product for cities, domestic overnights and uh, international visits too. Um, and how's tourism been doing? Well, we set, uh, uh, we set our, tar our sites to grow tourism five per by 5% over a 10-year period when we launched our uh, strategic framework for tourism in this country. And despite a slight dip in tourism last year, um, tourism is growing by 5%. It's growing to target, I'm very pleased to say. So, in essence, tourism, tourism is in a relatively help, healthy position. And where do cities sit in all of that? Well, we've heard a lot today about the power of cities, and cities without doubt have been at the centre stage of the growth of tourism in this country in recent years. 43% of all uh, domestic overnights and 45% of all day visits. Um, so quite clearly, uh, large towns and cities in particular in this country are the powerhouses of tourism. Um, and I, I must say I hate to get back to the, the London conundrum because we've uh, had a look at that a little earlier on, but the fact of the matter is that London predominates. It predominates in terms of urban day visits by quite some considerable margin, and it predominates in terms of domestic overnights. Now, I'm not losing sleep about that, as I said earlier on. I think the more worrying factor is the fact that all the total of international spend in this country is just about uh, £19 billion pounds per annum. Around 72% of that spend is committed in London and the South East which leaves places like Yorkshire with just 3% of the value of spend. So um, cities have a role, I think, not only in growing the value of tourism domestically in this country, but in particular internationally. And we may come back to that later on, and it's certainly something that we began a debate on 
at our recent Mind the Gap uh, conference earlier last week. So, um, and that is something of a context, really. We do a lot of research in Visit England. I don't think you can make any sensible decision uh, in terms of tourism without knowing what the market wants, what the market thinks, or indeed where the market might be going. And we've done a lot of research into customer perception, customer satisfaction of different facets of our offer. And in particular, cities. We have a whole range of uh, slides and, uh, and information that sits behind the perceptions of people who've actually visited cities in this country. It's fascinating stuff, and today is not the time, I'm afraid, to be able to unearth some of that. But really, um, it gives us some comparable data that allows us to compare Manchester with Bristol, Birmingham with Liverpool, uh, and Norwich uh, with Leeds. It is fascinating stuff. But in more general terms, the strengths of our cities, by people who have visited cities in this country, are that the ease of access, the broad range of activities on offer in cities, be it shopping, uh, social activities, clearly heritage and clearly culture um, as strong drivers of visits to our cities. But the perceived weaknesses are undoubtedly there. Poor value for money, high price car parking, less friendly welcoming um, and a less pleasant or safe environment. And maybe that just goes with the edgy nature of some of our cities, but that is genuinely what people think and say about the English city product. So what can we do to grow uh, the value of tourism to English cities? Well, information is power. People don't know what they don't know. Um, and I think we're all, I, I would be much more confident that our city destination management organizations, our city tourism organizations, are pretty slick when it comes to the marketing of their products. But don't be deceived, actually there is a very low awareness about what there is to see and do in our cities. There really is. And we ran some focus group rec work recently, and believe me, you would be amazed at how poor people's awareness, not only of what there is to see and do in our cities, but actually where the cities are. We asked people where Derby was. It's actually not far from Cardiff in a lot of people's minds. But, but we have a job to do in convincing people where we are, how easy we are to get to, and what there is to see and do. And above all, I think, maintain the product, keep improving the experience. It's always about continuous experience. I think we've got tremendous assets in our cities, but we operate in a massively competitive environment. And whilst the previous slide indicated that uh, visitors think that our cities are well connected, that's certainly the case north to south, are our cities particularly well connected east to west? Tomorrow, I am getting on a train in Manchester and I'm going to Norwich. Any clues of how long that'll take me? Five hours. Exactly. <laughs> well, no, not exactly. Four hours, 55. But <laughs> soul to the man in the hat. Absolutely. And so our connectivity might not be as good as we think it is. And we've got to continue to innovate and be competitive. As I say, we cannot be complacent, despite the fact that we feel we have got a strong product. And now this is where I, I, I uh, uh, unswervingly onto Lloyd territory here. What must we do to grow our uh, tourism value to our cities? Well, of course, it has to be distinctiveness. Why would you go somewhere if it was the same as somewhere else? Why would you do it? And there has been a tradition in this country of promoting and selling city breaks, but actually not the same tradition as international city breaks, European city breaks in particular. So we must focus on that which is distinctive and special. And like Lloyd, I, I suffer from this fear of any town, any place, Starbucks around every corner. I, I do genuinely believe you need a certain level of comfort. You need to know that there's a Starbucks. You need to know that there's a, a good chain restaurant. But you actually want to think that you have 
been somewhere that's different and special. And now, as we heard earlier on about the power of uh, always online and people tweeting and telling people about their experiences, people will tweet and tell you about their trophy experiences. They won't tweet and say, I've been to Starbucks in Manchester. But they will say, I've been to the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. And people want to show off about their weekends away, about their special stories. So you've got to have that distinctive, that special, that unique experience. Uniqueness is all. And here are some examples of where I think certain cities have done an excellent job in defining themselves around distinctiveness. Recently, Portsmouth, with the terrific Mary Rose uh, exhibition. If you haven't been, go. It's a defining moment. Um, and York, which has got a tradition of years and years of using the warp and weft, which is York culture, York heritage, and translating it into the York experience. Culture led uh, regeneration, no further than where we are already, but so too with Liverpool Gateshead. Um, and event led, and I'm sorry that Sir Howard has gone, because I certainly think that the um, Manchester International Festival has helped transform or continue to transform the people, the public's uh, appreciation of that which happens in Manchester. But Manchester Pride, uh, Cheltenham Literature Festival, all those festivals that are of the place and celebrate the place are what cities must hold on to if they are to thrive and survive. So where does the responsibility for all of this lie? Uh, we heard earlier some mentions about uh, that which much and should happen at a national level. Um, I, I won't really get on to that, other than I think um, there has to be more, a more of a joined up approach to the support and development of tourism in this country. It's not just at the behest of DCMS. We have to see other departments with a role in growing and supporting the life and health of cities, recognizing and realizing and supporting the value of tourism. We have to see that happen. Um, we, with our colleagues at Arts Council and English Heritage, are doing something in our own modest way. We launched cultural destinations recently, whereby we have made available certain limited funds for cities to bid into to recognize the value of cultural tourism. Um, but we really do need to get a greater handle on aligned funding at a national level to be spent in cities. And uh, my own personal favourite of that which must be done at a national level is connectivity through regional cities. You've probably heard me say this before, but Heathrow's at 99% occupancy at the moment. Manchester, the next highest, uh, occup um, the next highest, busiest airport in the country is only at 49%. There's got to be some realisation of the capacity and the potential of our regional airports in linking our cities outside London. And locally too, um, you've heard about great civic leadership today, but actually we've got to create joined up, connected places in our cities for visitors. We can't afford to have just great explosions in certain parts of our cities of great culture and great heritage that aren't connected. We've got to get the businesses connected too. Really, because we've got to do more with less. You know, public sector support has gone. We've heard mention of the RDAs. The RDA funding at £60 million a year has gone. We've got to do more with less. And the only way we can do that is become more conjoined at a national level and more conjoined at a local level. And I think in a fairly simple term, at a local level it's about planning. It's about destination management planning. It's about realising that cities are destinations that work a little bit like Alton Towers. They need to be connected. They all need to be great. All the experiences need to be great. They need to be memorable. And they need to be connected. And um, I would encourage all our destinations, as I do, to have a destination management plan, which isn't simply about marketing. It's about making sure that the experience is one that our visitors will remember forever and a day. So, collaboration is the key. Maybe easy for me to say that, but, it, but, it, but vital in this day and age of limited resource. And just to echo that which Lloyd said earlier, distinctiveness is absolutely key. Um, I was asked on a radio interview this morning um, about the future of Scarborough, actually. 
and the, the local radio interviewer uh, caught me at seven o'clock this morning, so I might not have been at my best. Um, but the interviewer said, well, what can we do to make Scarborough more like other destinations, more like other seaside destinations? I said, don't make Scarborough more like Scarborough. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Um, questions to James. But again, they can be to anybody now, really. Lloyd, here, please. The microphone is with you. Hello. Uh, Robert D. from Carlson Residor Hotels and also on the Atoa Steering Committee. Uh, I just want to pick up on something that was said earlier about um, the growth in Asian cities and, and the growth in that market generally, which of course will have an impact on tourism worldwide and particularly in Europe and the UK. If we want to attract tourists from those destinations, do we need to adapt our product to um, change and uh, really to, to fit their way and their culture? And I'm thinking particularly of um, Chinese and Indian tourists, which are seeing huge growth into some of our hotels. We're being told we need to look at things like offering Indian breakfasts and Chinese breakfasts in order to attract these tourists. But for me, like Lloyd said, something like your food and your great British breakfast would be part of your intangible cultural heritage. Should we adapt our cultural heritage and our, our cultural offering in order to attract tourists from these growing markets? In, in fact, is it even legitimate to think about adapting to attract new markets? Lloyd, it's pretty it's certainly legitimate to think, I would have thought, is it? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, interestingly enough, breakfast is the most culturally loaded meal of the day. And, you know, you travel around the world and you see them offering six, seven different types of breakfast. It's very, very difficult from people from different cultures to buy into another culture's breakfast. I mean, I cannot, for the life of me, understand the Nordic breakfast. Um, I have happily had the Egyptian, the Japanese, the Chinese, etc., etc. Um, so I think putting breakfast aside, um, in other ways, one still has to adapt to the needs of the new audience um, with their very different lifestyles and their very different expectations. Um, so I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't cling too, too single-mindedly to one size fits all when it comes to serving foreign visitors. Uh, I mean, I, I'd, I'd echo that. I think it's about adapting practices rather than a complete vault fast. I mean, mm. I, I, you know, I'm, we know in particular that China is a growth market for the future, but it is one for the future. I mean, I think if we were to start somewhere, we should start with being rather more welcoming than uh, we sometimes are. And I think that's probably the the cornerstone of, of, of making a welcome. And I have to reflect back on a, a comment made earlier today about uh, holding one of these up for a translation. God help us if uh, we have to rely on that to welcome our <laughs> Chinese visitors. Um, you know, it, 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 Chinese, any international visitor, we should be more welcoming, more understanding of their practices. We mustn't, though, make sure that our product changes completely. Did you have your own thoughts on this? Or, or, I mean, by all means, you know, offer, offer them back to us. Yeah, I, I just think it's a very difficult balancing act between maintaining your cultural heritage right. and welcoming visitors. Right. And I well remember about 20 years ago going to Grindelwald in Switzerland, a, a beautiful Alpine destination. But all the signage was in Japanese because they, they welcome so many <laughs> Japanese guests. And I, mean, I wasn't sure whether I was in Switzerland or whether I was in, in the Japanese mountains. You know? So I think it's a, it's a very fine balancing act. And whether you're a city or a accommodation provider or a supplier, to be able to maintain your cultural heritage but attract new markets, I think it's the biggest challenge that we face. Other questions, comments? You have a few more minutes? C can I make a call? Oh, sorry. Yeah, when well, you've got no. the microphone, I can't yeah. stop you, can I? Go on. No, I'm just very interested coming back to Lloyd's uh, Van Eyck because, for example, I think with some markets, Brazil, for example, one of the biggest selling points for the UK and Brazil is Jemmy Oliver. So is Jemmy Oliver a unique, is that part of our heritage that we should be selling? So what I'm saying is don't 
overly adapt what you offer here, don't present things that are not part of your culture, but you can identify in these markets things that are of interest. There's a famous tree in Cambridge, which was, I've forgotten the poet's name, which everybody wants to visit from the Chinese market, for example. Yeah. So it is possible to find the things here that appeal to other cultures. I don't know what you think about that. So should Jamie Oliver be listed, I suppose? Yeah, should he be part of our human of our cultural our, I don't heritage? Know, I, didn't cultural background. I, I don't know. I didn't realize the connection between him and Brazil. Um, I know very much about the Chinese poem and Cambridge. And that has become a, um, a, a major place of pilgrimage for Chinese tourists. Um, I think I, I want to get back to an issue which was raised earlier in, in, in passing by, by Howard, which is the whole issue of civic leadership, which is so important. But it, it's also a question to do with leadership of the, of the tourism business. When I became a commissioner of English heritage, I was asked to take responsibility for English heritage in the northwest of England, um, a prospect which absolutely terrified me for one reason, and the one reason was Howard Bernstein. So, um, because we were crossing swords a lot with Manchester, so, you know, I came up here duly and, and did my thing. And what I very quickly realized was that even though there were times when Howard and English Heritage and I were at absolute loggerheads, he loved Manchester to a degree which was so admirable. And he would do anything to promote that city. And that, to me, was real civic leadership. And it showed that you know, leadership is a quality that you can't teach and it's, it's very scarce. So the question I ask is that, you know, we now have a tourism structure in which there are something like 290 200, DMOs? 200, yeah, 200. Okay, yeah. there are 200 DMOs. How do you find 200 fabulous chief executives? Because it's the chief executive that makes the DMO work. And I think until we are less fragmented, we will not have the success we deserve in terms of getting the tourism industry taken seriously. Okay, I was just checking what a DMO was, which I'm, I ignorantly, everybody else will know what one was. It was a destination management organization. As opposed to a GMO. Yes. Okay, right, very good. One more, two more? Now is your chance or I will? Yes. I will uh, close the conference. Yes, hi, hi, Patrick Richards again. Um, okay, so on, on one angle we're hearing about the benefits of decentralization uh, and on the other too much fragmentation. How do we square that circle, gentlemen? Uh, yeah. okay. uh, uh, you, if you're going to decentralize, decentralize the money. Um, uh, you, 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 we are struggling with a fairly limited pot across England um, to do the job uh, of tourism. Now, I'm not complaining. That's how it is. So how much is it? Do, how much do you get and how big is the... You told us how big the industry was, but how much is the money you get in relation to the scale of the industry, roughly? Uh, my, currently, my core budget is £9 million. Pounds. Nine. And the, bud and the industry is? It's worth uh, uh, £83 billion. Mm. It's quite a ratio, isn't it? <laughs> Mm. Okay, sorry, I interrupted. No, no, not at all. Um, and, you know, I, I got on the heady days of there being masses and masses of money. I think we just rather, to, to your point about working against fragmentation, uh, and this is not a, a, a bid for me to, to, to call for more money for myself, not, well, for my organization, um, mm. but if you had something of a central pot that you could encourage more conjoined activity across this very fragmented world, uh, that would be immeasurably helpful. Which, in fairness to uh, Michael Heseltine, who is, I know, uh, much treasured in Liverpool, uh, has, although he wasn't specifically talking about tourism, I think his proposals for devolving to cities and city regions mm -hmm. finance would unquestionably unlock these kind of resources. Yeah. Absolutely. And certainly, I mean, localism, regionalism, devolution are all incredibly important and very desirable, but you have to know what the, wh where you stop. You can't devolve down to the parish council level when it comes to marketing destinations. And I think we have gone too far and it's become too fragmented. 
And the whole marketing of tourism, to me, was much better and more efficient when we had RDAs. Okay. Right. I know you need to go. We need to, I'm afraid I need to say a few words to uh, wrap up the conference. Can you wait while I do this? Mm. Take long? I wouldn't miss them. <laughs> Okay, well we're now at um, the end of the day and first I'd like to thank uh, all of you who've stayed here all day. We've had a good attendance right through the day, which is excellent. Um, it's certainly made, today's made me think a great deal more even than I normally do about the issue of place. We're talking about urban places, obviously here we're talking about cities, but about place. Uh, we're standing here in a new hotel, albeit in an old building, and in what is in many ways a new city, in what is clearly an old city, and that's not unique to Liverpool, it's true of Manchester and other cities besides. I think we've heard uh, today some discussion of cities' approaches to uh, making tourism more attractive, or not so much more attractive, but make sense to residents. I think tourism, where it's new or where it's at great scale, clearly doesn't always make sense to residents, and they need to buy in to it and understand the way in which tourism brings resources which enrich their lives. I certainly was born and brought up as a seaside town uh, and I've always been conscious throughout my life really that uh, you know everybody in the town survived because of people coming in in the summer. Without that there would have been nothing. Uh, and it is, I think, important that people understand that but equally that residents and increasingly I think younger tourists probably do this sort of want to get into the lives of the people that they're visiting and that's actually in many ways a positive step uh, if people want to understand the places and the lives of the people that they're going to. Uh, we've heard about tourism within urban economies from uh, Andrew Carter from the Centre for Cities and I think that un an understanding of how this industry, we've just heard these bizarre statistics about the amount, I can say they're bizarre, the amount of money that is uh, spent in promoting through uh, Visit England, I can say this is my view, not yours, um, it's been recorded, uh, you know, the amount that's spent on promoting a, a very large industry where, and I absolutely get this point, the, the sense, there is still a sense, I think not only in politics, in fairness to politicians, that somehow export earnings, economic activity generated by tourism or whatever we call it is somehow not as good as the same pound earned in another way. I've never quite understood this idea, but somehow a pound earned by exports because of somebody coming to see a museum or to see a theatre is not as good as a pound earned by exports selling, well, anything else. I mean, it's just, well, it's mathematically and economically wrong, of course. Um, we heard about the digital impacts on tourism that are brewing up around us, different consumers using a different range of platforms, I think it's fair to say these are, well, it's always early days with things digital, either too early or too late. Uh, but clearly, from what we heard this afternoon, the way uh, digital advertising and the digital world is moving on will affect uh, tourism. And finally, this afternoon, we've talked about how, what cities should do about heritage. Clearly, heritage is enormously important. I think, for me, sit, you, I have been sitting, we've been sitting, you have, facing this extraordinary building, probably the most extraordinary building I've seen for some time opposite us here with all the history embedded in it and all the potential that sits there in front of us because it is both and that's, that's pretty clear. We know now what we can do with buildings like this. The be different message and of course the uh, case for proper economic planning that we've heard from Howard uh, for a wider business base. I mean, rec uh, in some ways echoing what Andrew had said this morning, building a wider business base which tourism can prosper from and which, pros which tourism in turn will, in will benefit. This is a complex world. Listening to the debates and the contributions today, uh, it is complex because we're dealing with um, economics, we're dealing with people's residences or the way they live, we're dealing with city government, national government, a whole range of issues, but they're important. The attitude of politicians and residents clearly enormously uh, important to the whole of what we're discussing. Anyway, I just finished by saying, for me anyway, and I hope for you, it's been a great day. Uh, I'd like to thank ETOA and uh, Virgin and Visit England and others who've been involved in supporting uh, the whole of the event. 
Uh, and all I would say optimistically, and I think today has been an optimistic day in the sense that cities clearly do have not only a past, but they have a future as well. Thank you very much. And I'm going to hand on to Tom Jenkins. <laughs>